Okay, let's get started. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this seminar on robotics and construction, applications, opportunities, and challenges. My name is Ali Kolapchi, and I am the research and innovation scientist at the CIC. This session is organized jointly by the Construction Innovation Center, or CIC, at the University of Alberta, and the Center for Innovation, Construction, and Infrastructure Engineering and Management, or CSIM, at Concordia University. Uh, we have some great presenters lined up for this seminar, so I'll go through some quick items, and then we will get started with the presentations. Uh, this session is being recorded, and the link to the video recording will be shared with everyone who has registered through a follow-up email. Uh, the video will also be shared on the CIC and CSIMS websites. Um, I would like everyone to please uh, make sure your microphone is on mute, but I strongly encourage everyone to have their video on if possible, so we see some uh, smiley faces. Throughout the session, please type your questions in the chat and we will refer to them after all the presentations. Um, I would like to quickly point out that this is the first session in a series of seminars on robotics and automation construction. Throughout the series, we're, we will have online seminars on different aspects of automation, robotics, and digitalization and construction. So please watch out for our emails for the announcement of those sessions. Uh, we are going to launch a Zoom poll after the presentations and before the panel discussion to collect your feedback on which of these topics you're most interested in so we can plan accordingly. So please participate in that poll once we get there. As mentioned, this is a joint event by the CIC and the CSIM. So I'm going to start with asking the directors of the two centers to give us a brief introduction of each center. We will start with Dr. Salam Salhi, the director of CSIM. Dr. Salhi, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Ali. And uh, before we start, I'd just like to thank my colleagues uh, at uh, CIC in the University of Alberta and also our colleagues at Concordia University in CCM for really organizing this uh, uh, first um, seminar in the series of automation and robotics in construction. So thank you all for making this event happen. I'll, uh, next slide, please. So the uh, center was launched in uh, 2019. CCM strives to be a world-class research center that serves uh, as Concordia University's flagship for innovation in construction, automation, and civil infrastructure engineering and management. Um, the 18 members plus uh, of the center uh, come from five departments at Gina Cody School of Engineering and Computer Science, in addition to other members from industry and academia in uh, Canada and in the US. They were all working to provide a value-driven integrated digital solutions to improve uh, safety, productivity, and competitiveness of the construction industry, as well as solutions that would optimize budget allocation for maintenance, rehabilitation, and or renewal of uh, civil infrastructure assets to meet public demands uh, for targeted uh, levels of service and also uh, resilience. Next, please, Ali. Yeah, the center have a number of directors in order to manage its all affairs on a day-to-day -day basis. And I have here the pleasure of having with us today, uh, uh, Dr. Hamad is the associate director. So kindly raise your hand and be recognized. And also Dr. Uh, Mazdak Nikbat is the director of communication and outreach. Thank you, Mazdak. And also Dr. Sang Han, the director of media, kindly raise your hand. Thank you all. As we said, the, 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 the center house five major laboratories. Uh, three of them are CFI laboratories. CFI stands for Canadian Foundation for Innovation. We have the Construction Automation Lab. We have also the CFI Structures and Infrastructure Testing Laboratory. We have CFI Structure Safety and Simulation Laboratories, in addition to a couple of labs. The one is the Cyber uh, uh, Physical Construction and Infrastructure Systems Laboratory, and Sustainable Energy and Infrastructure Systems Engineering Laboratories. We will work on a number of areas, as you could see on the right here of the screen, automation, robotics, and construction, uh, sensing technology, and the use of uh, uh, um, Internet uh, of Things, and its application in construction and infrastructure, big data analytics, and uh, uh, data science application, 
uh, industrialization of construction, and that would be uh, modular construction and offsite construction, and uh, reliability analysis and condition assessment of uh, uh, civil infrastructure assets. Next, please. We have also in the advisory board, and this would be my last slide before I thank you all for your attention. Uh, we have uh, members from uh, representing major or rather owners of major constructed facilities. Uh, we have Chantal Germain, followed now by Marie Jose Lambert from Hydro Quebec. We have also uh, uh, contractors, general contractors like Eric Lassard at the bottom here of the list from Pomerlo in Montreal. And we have also Tony Pigeon from uh, Canam Manac. This is the largest structure steel fabricator in Canada, and they have facilities across the globe. And then we have uh, also representatives from two large EPCM uh, firms, uh, SNC Lavalan, we have uh, Hajir uh, Irmani, and Hatch, we have uh, Les McMillan. With that, uh, this would be a quick overview of our activities and the structure of uh, CCM at Concordia. I encourage all of you to search, if you wanted to search just CCM, Concordia University, that will lead you to the website. Thank you, Ali. I'll stop here. Great. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mousselhi. We're excited to be partnering uh, with CSIM. Uh, next, I'm going to invite Dr. Yasser Mohammed, the director of the CIC, to introduce the center. Uh, Dr. Yasser, please go ahead. Thank you, Ali. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mousselhi. It's uh, a pleasure to see you all today. And I would like, uh, on behalf of the CIC, to welcome you all. And uh, I'll just give a very uh, quick uh, overview about uh, the CIC. Uh, Ali, if you can go to the next slide, please. The CIC, or the Construction Innovation Center uh, at the University of Alberta, was established in 2019. Uh, a little bit shy of uh, three years old now. Uh, but it is an umbrella organization or an umbrella center for uh, four well-established uh, centers uh, in the civil engineering department, the whole School of Construction, the Nasri School of Building Science and Engineering, the Steel Center, and the Masonry uh, Center. And uh, uh, combined, they uh, actually have access or provide access to uh, almost uh, over 30 engineering professors, not only in civil engineering, but in mechanical and uh, electrical engineering as well. And also combined, we have over 50 uh, partners uh, providing support uh, to the center and uh, the, the, the different centers and the CIC as well. These uh, partners range from uh, general contractors, uh, industrial contractors, uh, home building uh, companies, uh, steel fabrication, masonry, uh, um, some uh, um, government organization and uh, owner, the owner associations as well, construction owner associations. Uh, next slide, please, Ali. Uh, the main goal of or goals of the center, I'm not going, going to go into the details of this, uh, but basically uh, to provide three things, uh, innovative solutions for construction problems that are identified by uh, our partners. So we strive to um, identify what are the real practical problems that uh, the partners are looking for solutions. And then form teams, multidisciplinary teams, to provide solutions uh, to these problems that we identify. Technology transfer, so whatever solutions that we have, whatever solutions that already exist, we want to make sure that uh, our partners are aware of that and uh, help them uh, get more information about it. Uh, these series that we have in here in collaboration with uh, CSIM and Concordia is a case uh, in point and uh, finally, the training for highly qualified personnel or HQPs, which, provide, which basically represent the future engineers that will carry the, the, the workload in these companies. This is done uh, by uh, from supporting funds from these companies in the form of endowments. Uh, we have uh, close to 1.2 million of uh, endowments that uh, uh, on an annual basis. We use these as seed funding to support research projects and also to support activities like the one we have today. Uh, I'm really uh, pleased to have this in collaboration with uh, CSIM at the University of Concordia, and I thank them for all the support and uh, their uh, willingness to be to partner on uh, activities like this one 
and we look forward to expand this collaboration to other centers in Canada. Uh, again, uh, pleased to have you all here today. Uh, welcome, and I hope that you enjoy uh, the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Mohammed. And here's the website and our email for the CAC. So please feel free to um, get in touch with us and visit our website. Um, okay, so we're now going to start with the presentations. Uh, just a reminder to please type your questions in the chat and we'll discuss them at the Q&A period. First, Dr. Salam Selhi and Dr. Amin Hamad will provide an overview of the main applications of robotics in construction. Dr. Moselhi is a professor at the Department of Building, Civil and Environmental Engineering at Concordia University and the director of CSIM. Dr. Hamad is also a professor at the Concordia Institute for Information Systems Engineering at Concordia University, and he is an associate director of CSIM. Uh, Dr. Moselhi, over to you. Thank you, Ali, for the uh, introduction. Let me put this in the uh, presentation mode. You all see my screen? Yes, we do. Yeah, and you hear me? Okay, thank you, Ali, again for the introduction. And again, it's a great pleasure to uh, join forces with uh, CIC at University of Alberta. So I'd like to thank you, Ali, in particular, and also Dr. Uh, Yasser Mohammed for initiating this uh, particular joint venture. Uh, next, uh, I will uh, move to tell you one story. It's really a whole story that uh, the use of robotics is not new in construction. Um, the document that they see on the right of the screen here, I uh, had the pleasure of editing that uh, uh, particular publication and uh, also producing it on behalf of IARC, the International Association for Automation and Robotics in Construction. But here are two, two major questions. Why robotics? In the second major question, what are the contents of these uh, 80 uh, robots? What do they do? So let's start with the first question. The young professionals in Japan at the time, they did not want to join construction industry for a number of reasons, and they're summarized in the four Ds, but they were more attracted to the IT sectors and computer science and working in a in a clean office environment. So uh, it's just because it is dirty, this is how they perceived that our industry at the time, dirty, dull, dangerous, and difficult. And let me put it this way, really the main motives for using robotics in construction would be, as you could see here at the bottom line, cost, 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 safety, 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 and at times also, uh, quality may necessitates the use of these robots. And if you have the time during the panel discussion, I will have example to demonstrate how at times uh, a very stringent requirements and specification can dictate the use of automated equipment such as robots. Uh, as to in general, the entire uh, representation and utilization of robots in construction, one can maybe cluster them into three areas. Construction operations, what you see in the field, welding, uh, distributing concrete, finishing concrete, that kind of stuff, and including also fabrication of modules in off-site construction activities. The second major area would be in data capturing. And by the way, in the fabrication, you will hear later on Mr. Attar about uh, the use in uh, fabrication of various modules and the use of robots in that domain. Also here in data capturing, and we'll use, and we'll see from Mr. Karimi from uh, Pomerlo later on, on how we could use a robot uh, uh, with a payload of various sensing technologies to capture data from construction job sites. The last category is really has to do with inspection. And I have one example that I will share with you. One of the robots in those 80 robots in, in that publication will be in inspection of buildings. And the other will be in uh, bridge decks and that you will hear more of our speaker, uh, Professor Gugniski, uh, later on in the presentation. So about these 80 robots, there uh, some are completely autonomous. In other words, there is no man or a human that would really need to, uh, to be mounting these equipment or guiding these equipment. Or sometimes semi-automated and remotely controlled, but in any case, they cover a wide range of applications from demolition, excavation, paving, tunneling, 
uh, concrete placement, uh, screening of concrete, uh, cement floor finishing, uh, uh, positioning of structural steel members and welding structural steel members, fireproofing, painting, and inspection. In the next few slides, I will show you with you one example on the concrete slab finishing robots, this one. And I also share with you an inspection of a building robots. But then later on, and major corporations in, in Japan worked on the development of what we know now as field factory. In other words, integrated use of more than one robots to construct and finalize one floor at a time from the ground up. So I will give you an example right here and also an example down there in inspection. So this is the uh, uh, cement floor finishing, or we could call it uh, uh, concrete slab finishing robots. This is developed by Kejima Corporation in Japan. And as I said, in, these, uh, in this publication that we produced for iARC, each of these robots are described in two pages. But the beauty of what the structure of these two pages, it really described the, the company that developed the robots, the field of application of the robots, the operating conditions of the robots, and most important here is the work execution records. In other words, it was used in a project one, two, three, four. It has a scope of work of so many square meters. For example, if we're finishing concrete slab uh, on site, and this is the kind of thing, and what was the added benefit of using it? So all of this information are reported there. The second application here is really the integrated building construction. As I said, there's only maybe four or five major corporations in Japan that develop systems like that. So the A, B, C, S systems are o, Obayashi Corporation and also the smart system of Shimizu Corporation. And the Oyubashi is the, the one that you see on the right of the screen. Uh, here is the, the smart system of uh, Shimizu. And you could see that they're constructing by using more than one robot at a time to finish a floor, go up from the ground all the way until you finish that. So that was the, 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 the second category of using robots in construction was data capturing. And one of the best examples here, and you will see more of that from uh, Mr. Karimi from uh, Pomerlo, is that you would have that uh, moving robots in with a payload uh, capturing digital images or maybe 3D laser scanning, so point cloud for other application and you wanted to use that for safety, productivity, and also for progress reporting at times. The third category of uh, uh, the utilization of robots in construction would be inspection. And as I said, one of the 80 robots in that publication will be used in building inspection. I will give you an example of that. And then later on also with more details on bridge uh, condition assessment, uh, bridge decks in particular. Here is the, uh, the robots that were developed, exterior wall tile inspection robots developed by Taisi corporations in Japan. And what you can see here is uh, this particular robot would scan the entire facade up and down. And by doing that through the analysis of the vibration of sound, you will be able to identify areas where you have loose tiles uh, and then you would uh, carry the repair as needed. Uh, in the area of inspection, uh, here would be um, that particular robot. You would see more of that from Professor Gugniski, and this is for condition assessment of bridge decks. I'll leave that to Dr. Gugniski. He will give you more details on that. And uh, before I let you go, I want to tell you a little bit about the future of robots and construction. And as you can see here, they are predicting almost half a billion dollars. And I'm talking about also North America. Uh, of uh, robotics in construction by the year 2026, but also in various uh, levels, fully automated, or fully autonomous, semi-autonomous, and also they could see some of major areas of applications. And I, uh, I haven't really seen much of that yet in actual practice, but I think this is coming, 3D printing and also demolition robots uh, and other applications in the uh, building area. Uh, regardless of how it is quarter of a billion dollar or half a billion dollar, but in what I could see here is the trend is moving up. You could see here the trends from 2018 all the way to 2005 or six, you could see that growth. With that, I would wrap up my presentation. I'll be more than happy to address some of the questions later on. Thank you all very much for your attention. 
Thank you, Dr. Muselhi. Uh, Dr. Hamad, please feel free to. Yes, okay. <clears throat> Do you see my screen? <coughs> Sorry, yes, do you see my screen? Do. Yes, we do. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Uh, I will follow up with the presentation of Dr. Musilhi focusing on some recent examples of construction robotics. Uh, here I have um, uh, uh, a list of uh, types of ro construction robots, but it's not uh, in uh, all uh, inclusive list. The first two bullets about the autonomous robots versus teleoperated equipment or the fixed versus mobile robots. I will show you several examples about these two uh, categorization uh, of the equipment. And then the rest actually are about things that I'm not going to talk about today, but could be the topic of future seminars. So this is very rich uh, area of research about UAV based robots, assembly robots, prefabrication robots, uh, site factories that Dr. Mosulhi mentioned earlier, 3D printing, uh, exoskeletons, and space and underwater robots. The examples that I selected are uh, mostly from commercially available robots, and most of these are uh, in the early stage of deployment, although the domain is not new, as uh, Dr. Mosley mentioned, it's more than 30 or 40 years old, but uh, in fact, uh, there is some resistance, as we will see later on in the discussion, and uh, there, there is high uh, potential for uh, further penetration in the market. Uh, the <clears throat> robots that I will uh, show are mostly single task robots. So I will talk about robotic excavators, welding, bricklaying, rebar tying, uh, robotic deconstruction, drywall installation and inspection and service robots. So this is the first example uh, for robotic excavator from a startup company called Build Robotics. So I'll play the video. There's a huge issue in construction right now. We can't find enough people who are qualified Did to I do share the work that to be done. So what we're trying to do is help. Uh, I, I don't think you can hear Yes, that. yes, we can hear it. Hear it, Dr. Hamad, we hear it. Okay, great. So I, I'm not sure if I did it, but it seems I did. There's a huge issue in construction right now. We can't find enough people who are qualified to do the work that needs to be done. So what we're trying to do is help solve some of that problem by making machines be able to operate by themselves in order to do sort of more basic tasks on job sites. And then you can use your skilled guys to operate the equipment and to do the more, the more finesse kind of jobs that need a little bit more judgment and touch. That little black box that you see on the roof of Dorothy and inside of there, there's a computer with some high-end GPUs, some GPSs, IMUs, cameras, and LiDAR. Okay. The second example is about welding robots. So as you can see here, there are two robots that work in parallel and the path planning should be done very carefully to avoid any collision between them, as well as to achieve high quality welding lines. So as you can see, uh, this is done usually in controlled environment offsite, uh, similar to manufacturing. The third example is for bricklaying robot. It's a specific model called SAM 100. Uh, it requires guidance from human workers, and it's claimed that it can lay 3,000 bricks a day, which is three times the productivity of a human uh, worker. Uh, it can also achieve novel structures that could be more complicated than the regular work. Uh, as you can see, the cost is quite high, about half million US dollars. Uh, so as you see in the video, a robot moves uh, on a rail parallel to the work uh, of the application. The bricks will be fed the robot, the robot arm will be at the mortar and then uh, put the brick at the final location. As you can see also, there are some workers on the back side of the robot as well as another worker for monitoring the work of the robot. <coughs> another brick laying robot from Australia called uh, Hadrian X, another startup company, uh, similar to the previous one, except that this one has more mobility. It looks like uh, mobile crane, uh, and that will allow not only building one single wall, but a complete house. Uh, so there are initial trials, but it's not really uh, fully deployed at the time. Yet. So again, here we have these bricks that will be fed to the machine, as you will see, based on 3D drawing of the, of the house to be built. We have the quantities and uh, also we have the cutting of this 
bricks based on the needs and the geometry. And then the uh, elements will be moved through the robotic eye and adhesive will be added. In this case, it's not mortar. It's a specific material that's faster to dry. And then we have the precision uh, positioning of these elements. And here you can see that a whole house can be built from one wall to another wall. And they claim that they can build a whole house in three days, in addition to the safety and quality uh, improvement issues. Another robot for, <coughs> for uh, rebar tying from a startup company uh, coming from Carnegie Mellon University uh, and Tybot, Advanced Construction Robotics' first product, is an autonomous rebar tying robot. At ACR, what we're trying to do is methodically look at the most difficult critical path challenges in the construction market. Our first product sort of highlights that. One of our big challenges is finding people to tie deck rebar. So we focused on developing a robot that will in fact uh, tie deck rebar. Tiebot ties intersections continuously, day or night, without breaks, complaints, or injuries. Okay, we have also robotic deconstruction. We have several models uh, for uh, cutting uh, concrete by sewing or by using water-based concrete demolition. And uh, it's claimed that they can achieve about 93% recycling ratio for materials and parts. Uh, this model uh, is a humanoid robot from a research, a public research lab in Japan. Uh, and for the main usage is for installing drywall sheets. Uh, but as you will see in the video, it can be customized for other tasks. So as you can see, we have a very large number of degrees of freedom. We have a lot of flexibility. Uh, however, that of course the cost is quite high for this type of robot. Another example from Japan that Dr. Motsuhi mentioned, but this is the newer version that has been released about a year ago. It's called Shimizu Smart Side. And the idea here is that we have a, a collection of robots. It's not a single robot. We have robotic crane. We have a robotic welder. Uh, we have multifunction robot mainly for installation of drywalls, etc. And we have robo carrier for horizontal uh, transportation of uh, products. And these robots will communicate and coordinate their work with each other under an, an all weather cover, so it can work under different weather conditions. The last two examples are related to inspection and service robots. The first one is for window cleaning. So this is a product from China where they have a lot of high rise buildings and uh, this robot can work under uh, different weather conditions. And uh, they claim that it has the uh, productivity 10 times faster than a human cleaner. And it has about 150 sensors and a large number of actuators to uh, achieve the task. This another uh, inspection robot, similar to the one that we will see later today, uh, but it's a, a very simple robot that has a 3D laser scanner installed on it, a uh, regular scanner, so it can scan the construction site up to work towards, uh, collect a large uh, data set based on point cloud, and this will be used to detect the object that has been installed and calculate the productivity and the progress monitoring through the day as well as uh, also quality inspection. So this is my part, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh... Okay. Okay, uh, thank you Dr. Musalhi and Dr. Hamad for the overview of main applications of robotics in construction. Uh, next, we're going to have presentations on use cases and lessons learned of improving construction through robotics. First off, we have Ramtin Attar. Ramtin is the CEO and co-founder of Promise Robotics, a venture-backed technology startup with the mission to help the building industry harness industrialized robotics and AI toward the production of more affordable and sustainable buildings. Prior to founding Promise Robotics, Ramtin was a founding member of Autodesk Research, where he assumed several key leadership roles during his 13 years at Autodesk. Uh, the floor is yours, Ramtin. Thanks for the uh, intro. I'm just going to share my screen. Uh, so let me know if things are showing up properly on your end. Yes, they are. 
Well, thanks for uh, inviting me to uh, join this uh, presentation. I'm happy to share a little bit, sort of a brief, about sort of what Promise Robotic is doing, why we're doing it, and how we're doing it. Uh, as mentioned, we are sort of an early stage of startup, uh, VC back uh, with a sort of a core mission to enable the AC industry to harness industrial robotics and AI towards the economic and environmental challenges of 21st century. And as a sort of a customer facing uh, company, I often find myself in the position I have to sort of a, a little bit demystify a term that are used uh, synonymously and you know, interchangeably in, in our industry. So uh, often I sort of uh, say, hey, industrialization is really about simplification of the product of production to reduce the cost and increase the efficiency. So you can make a product available to more people. And I think, you know, having gone through the pandemic, this was a great example of an industry that is highly industrialized. Otherwise, you know, despite the discovery or, you know, creating of a new vaccination, you would not be able to get it to as many people as possible. So we have a lot of processes. On the other hand, as much as we often think automation is sort of a modern invention. In fact, I think automation is ingraining in humanity. This is one of the uh, sort of a first robots recorded in the history of mankind. It goes back to 250 BC. Uh, and it was actually the sort of a, the modern version of, sorry, the ancient version of the TikTok to indicate the passage of time used not to measure the hours, but actually to count the time allocated for an event. So I think you know, the, our ability to actually embed actions and decisions in the machine is, is much more prehistoric than we want to accept it. And, and then lastly, AI, again, sort of being a sort of attributed to the modern science, ultimately about sort of enabling a machine to act more intelligently. And of course, you know, you're all also the experts in sort of the different versions of AI and sort of the different types of machinery and where they show up. And in our case, it's about really embedding that intelligence into uh, a machine like uh, industrial robots. Now, you know, unlike all other industries which have witnessed relatively uh, a steady technological advancements over the past several decades, you know, as you know, construction sector has been much slower to adopt new technologies. So when we started Promise Robotic, this mission of democratization of automation and industrial concept, uh, construction, essentially for us involved first creating new technical advances to overcome the economic barriers that we consider have previously prevented the adoption of industrialized method. And this is fundamentally about turning around the economics of production and industrialized construction by lowering the cost of automation itself. And second, how we use our technical advantage towards having a flexible business model that focuses on providing continuous long-term value, that's sort of a one-off solution. And this also sort of means that we need to go beyond the mindsets that have dominated existing manufacturing technologies for construction available in the market today. You know, we are in an industry that has one of the lowest budgets uh, per revenue as a percentage of revenue as they spent on the technology and sort of we rank the second least digitized sector of our economy. So the barrier is quite high. So for us at Promise Robotic, that essentially means sort of a looking at a technology platform, but also a business model platform. Technology platform meant sort of create a ready to deploy robotic production systems for offsite construction. And that has major implications for how you can lower the cost. So you don't do one-offs every time. And the second was, creating and looking at this as sort of an enterprise production management system in order to be able to actually completely change the deployment of these robotics. It's such that it could provide new business model opportunities that could sort of be more sort of a service oriented. So that way, maybe we could start to offset the capital structure of how typically we invest in these technologies, which is a major barrier. So with that in mind, really sort of a promise robotic is working hard to bring what we call the smart factory products into the construction market to basically with the goal of the bringing the most flexible, scale efficient and high value robotic solution. In other words, call it the fleet of robotic solutions that could be deployed in terms of different types of factory for uh, digital manufacturing and assembly of sustainable building from single family homes to multi-story buildings. Again, 
I came from the Autodesk. Uh, some of you, especially if you're from University of Alberta, may also be familiar with my co-founder, who is a, a sort of an owner and a founder of Landmark Homes. So we started Promise Robotic uh, sort of a, from a very deep roots in prefabrication and having operated one of the most advanced automated factories in North America for uh, sort of a timber-based construction, a factory that is able to produce over 100,000 square feet of uh, monthly production, that equivalent of eight. 800 homes have completed over 9 million square feet from single family to multi-story. So for us, when we looked at challenges that we had to address through the sort of the starting of the Promise Robotic, a lot of it was inherent in what we consider, you know, limitations of setting up these type of factories and how do we actually scale these type of productions. So our experience really expand the entire sort of the assembly model. So because in this factory, we could produce almost three homes or sometimes four homes a day. So you could start a single family home on a Monday morning and essentially have it fully assembled on a Tuesday afternoon and lock it up by Wednesday. So that it has a very high productivity rate, but most importantly, we had managed the entire sort of a workflow as sort of a turnkey solution from bid and estimating all the way to the digital construction and production transportation assembly. So we started sort of thinking very deeply about every single element of how we need to think completely differently about this future of manufacturing for the construction sector. So now in the last several years, a lot of the data that is coming out that is showing the increasing market of the prefabrication in the construction industry. And there's sort of a leading to the quickening pace in transition to the offset construction. So we've talked to a lot of different companies that they're either have already started doing some prefab or they're looking, doing some projects in prefab or even building their own team and to set up their digital transformation model and how they wanna to start to get into the prefab model. However, to understand the degree of readiness and motivations, you know, as we talked to a lot of the companies and sort of started to map their journeys and existing approaches and the future plan, you know, I sort of put this together of what I call sort of the ladder of adoption in sort of a prefab market because we want to be able to actually understand where you are in the ladder, what your motivation is, and what is your degree of readiness. So if you actually start at the bottom of the ladder and say, hey, uh, you got the on-site construction, this is how we've done it for hundreds and hundreds of years. The next one we notice is the companies start to call what we call off-site manual. This is essentially is about taking the construction indoor. So you start to get into the model of, hey, I'm going to set up a factory, I'm going to use lean processes, you're not really necessarily incorporating any high digitization or hardware system. By, by the virtue of moving into the factory model, you're trying to apply some lean production model to this. The next one then becomes about offsite, what I call semi-automated. This is where you start to create some digital workflow between what you do, for example, in a BIM model and maybe some hardware systems that you start to do. Even these hardware system could be semi-automated or it could just be some sort of rigs that you assign to bring in some higher degree of productivity. And the last one is really sort of a full automated model that we started to see. So as you go along these steps, obviously you need to make a lot more investments, but more importantly, what we learned, a lot of companies actually start to face what we call sort of a massive trade-offs. So on one track, you know, trajectory, you've got these trade-offs between labor intensity and the other one's capital and knowledge intensity. So the higher you go, you actually really need to change your mindset, your culture, you need to learn a lot more, but you also need to spend a lot more money. But at the same time, you need to make this sort of a trade-off between, okay, I'm gonna get high productivity, I understand it, but I'm also gonna lose a lot of my flexibility. And a lot of this flexibility is as far as what I can build, but also sort of just the business flexibility in terms of when the economy goes down, well, now I'm sort of a stuck with a big factory. What am I going to do about this? So our goal as Promise Robotic has been sort of a, to remove that ladder, essentially to bring this horizontal sort of nature where regardless of where you are in that ladder of production and your thinking, we want to be able to provide you with a path into a most flexible, a scale efficient, high value production system, which ultimately came down to changing the economic of the production. And what that means for us is really means to go beyond traditional manufacturing thinking. It's a difference between what I call mechanized automation versus smart automation, right? We've been doing mechanized automation for a very really long time, which we consider it's essentially, it's about creating a fixed single purpose built, highly mechanical equipment with a one size fits all that essentially uh, with, has a very high upfront capital, it's very unconnected, has a limited feedback loop, 
And it also takes a long time to set up, adjust, repurpose, and maintain. And in a business term, you would say it has a very long payback time at the sort of very high volume production. Now, when we talk about a smart automation, because we're a robotic company, a lot of people, the first question they ask is, is this the type of company, is this the type of factory that you're talking about? And the reality of it is, is yeah, you know, automotive has actually done a great job in terms of taking the mechanized automation to the next level using robotic as a very versatile uh, sort of automation system. And today, over half of the robots in the world are deployed by automotive industry, and they've been able to reduce the cost almost to 30 cents an hour per robot. But the fact is that automotive has a very different economics than construction. And we construction, we have what we call a high variability, low volume problem where we're not producing in volume and we're not distributing to an integrated supply chain. Well, so when we compare the economics of manufacturing with that of construction industry, you know, the central problem is not so much incorporating of the robotics in a traditional sense where you can orchestrate an army of robots to do repetitive tasks and singular tasks 24 seven. It's about how do we get the highest value of these robots? And that's essentially comes to what we call sort of the economics of automation versus economics of autonomy. So if you start from sort of a no cognition of no, auton no autonomy, that sort of a robot just does repetitive tasks that are highly fixed, our goal at Promise Robotic is essentially to move up to bringing more sensing and perception, more autonomous knowledge acquisition, and essentially build more cognition models and autonomy in the robots to enable robots to do higher level tasks. So this is essentially the core technology at sort of what we're building at Promise Robotics. So we actually consider ourselves, even though we're developing hardware, being a sort of a hot software company, our team actually has more software engineers than robots engineers to build what we call sort of the AI knowledge systems for skills and assemblies and all processes. Because when you talk about sort of the assemblies in the construction, you're talking about a lot of variability, a lot of the details that for, for example, the manual framer comes as a tacit skilled knowledge, but for the robots doesn't come as sort of a common sense. So we need to be able to do this in a very intelligent way to be able to do high variability work. And that's essentially sort of what, so sort of one of the areas that we have been developing at, at, at Promise Robotic to be able to really take the design and use an AI system that essentially automatically generates pretty sophisticated assembly instruction for robots that can be distributed and that they can be modularized or so what. Another element of this is being able to do high variable tasks. So the robot is not assigned to do one thing. So it's not a single trade, but is able to actually switch and be able to have a software backend to be able to actually support that variability of tasks and the sequencing and the simulation and the offline programming. And ultimately, you know, you cannot just build a brain, you got to build a tool. So we've also been building all our own smart tool to be able to provide the highest variability of tasks from notching, nailing, stapling, and so forth that could all be sequenced within the AI system. And of course, you need to have a KPI, production KPI. So we've used, you know, robust data from the production to be able to really have very intelligent conversation with a lot of the construction companies that we're talking to, to really say, hey, you really need to think about your bottom line differently. Have, how about manufacturer things, not a dollar per square foot necessarily. You need to look at your unit contribution margin. You need to look at your return on the asset, your revenue per employee, if you really want to start to look at incorporation of automation. And ultimately, you know, we look at sort of the mechanized automation versus a smart automation. And we talk about how, first of all, you start to change completely your technology capex. You can realistically really reduce that capital investment that you need to do upfront, reduce your opex, and bring economics of a scale efficiency, which means you don't only have to do high volume now to make this economic, you can actually do low volume and you can have much faster deployment of these technologies that could actually bring this technology much closer to the, what uh, I think Professor Sama called the field uh, automation or field factories and ultimately the flexibility and value add. So a robotic solution should not be sort of a, just a one-off. It needs to be able to almost be like a computer, plug and play. Now, when you buy a computer, you can do plug and play ads on, right? You go buy this equipment, you buy that equipment, and you don't need to go through the whole rejigging of that. So that's how we look at ourselves in the market today. We see there are a lot of software solutions that really don't really address the industrialization part. Again, they are really just supporting uh, manual factories, so they are really focusing on HR management, manual tasks, you know, documentation workflow. Then we got this history of mechanized automation with traditional mechanized tools 
which is very hardware centric, very capital intensive. The third one is what we call custom automation solution. Now we're seeing an emerging of industrial robotics in the prefab, but they are highly custom developments. They're not generalized enough with a little value add and little software integration for uh, the entire production systems. And that's essentially the fourth quarter that Promise Robotic is trying to fill in, which is we need an enterprise production platform with a ready to deploy system. So essentially an industrialized automation solution for prefab the same way other industries have done it to be able to do this with a very robust software backend. So we need to make three and a half million homes. This is just one of the challenges that I'm not gonna in the interest of time to talk about you know, net zero economy. I'm not gonna talk about labor shortage, the skill change and so forth. How are we gonna make this happen? Let's say we wanna build 1 million homes by 2035. And if you've been reading the uh, uh, government budget, you know we're putting a lot of money into this to make this happen. Well, we can do this with 3,800 robots from now till 2035. And if you think this is a lot of robots, GM alone has 30,000 robots deployed globally. A Tesla factory in average has about 700 robots. So this is not a lot of robots come for building 1 million homes. We need to create 16,000 new jobs that are quite diverse. We can actually bring more of the women into this workforce because these are not site jobs that require a lot of physical labor. We can actually save $30 billion just by increasing our cycle time and recapture that money from the refinancing that is equivalent to 120,000 new homes that could be circled back into that equation. We talk about sort of embodied carbon reduction and also operational carbon reduction. So the opportunity is huge and towards this Promise Robotic has been building what we call an impact model using UN sustainable goals to really be able to communicate both the positive impact of this and the productivity impact to the customer facing. And with that, I'm going to end my presentation. And thank you again for inviting me to present here. Great. Thank you so much, Ramtin. Uh, very interesting um, and, and right on time. So thank you. Uh, next up, we have Dr. Nina Gusunski. Uh, Dr. Gusunski is a professor and chairman of the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at Rogers University. He's also the director of the Infrastructure Condition Monitoring Program at the Rogers Center for Advanced Infrastructure and Transportation. He has extensive research and practical experience in the development and application of non-destructive evaluation technologies for condition assessment and monitoring of transportation infrastructure, bridges, and pavements. Over to you, Dr. Gusunski. Thank you very much. Let me share my screen. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Good morning for some. Um, as uh, Professor Moselki, when he spoke about different groups of applications of robotics, in the third group, he mentioned inspection of existing structures. And this is what my talk is going to be about. In particular, I will be speaking about the use of robotics in condition assessment of concrete bridge decks. Uh, uh, this was initially announced as that I will be speaking only about condition assessment, but you, I will also very briefly address uh, also use of uh, robotics in rehabilitation of concrete bridge decks. So the first question which we could ask is uh, why we should use automation, uh, in particular in the, in the use of non-destructive evaluation technologies, and how it is going to be critical for good bridge management. Uh, you have already seen on uh, this slide is that uh, what we very often see on our bridges that these concrete bridge decks have uh, signs of previous repairs. There, are, there is new damage on the surface of those bridge decks. And the reason why it is happening is because from all bridge components, concrete decks, they are deteriorating the fastest because they are directly exposed to both traffic and environmental loads. Uh, what we have demonstrated that uh, non-destructive evaluation technologies, that they enable detection and characterization of both uh, defects and deterioration at all stages of their development. So we can also detect those problems in their very early stages. Uh, one of the problems with any kind of inspection of bridges, uh, on bridges, especially bridge decks, is that those can lead to significant traffic interruptions. 
And that is why automation is so critical, not just to reduce traffic interruptions, but also to reduce inspection costs and also to reduce risks to both transportation workers and drivers. So when we are speaking about bridge decks, these are typically the problems we are concerned about. Uh, corrosion of reinforcement, uh, which is typically going to lead to delamination, so which are those horizontal cracks very often on the level of top rebars, and they are typically leading to spalls. And finally, we are interested in the overall concrete degradation. So what I will be speaking about is I will provide a brief overview of manual non-destructive evaluation technologies we are using these days for evaluation of concrete bridge decks, and then I will move to the discussion of automation of and the data collection. I will also illustrate uh, some of the reasons. I will provide as illustrations some of the results, but primarily I will be speaking about the benefits stemming from ND surveys. Uh, I have mentioned this, that I will also speak a little bit about rehabilitation and I will provide a little bit, so to say, my vision for how we should be merging robotic evaluation and rehabilitation of bridge decks. And finally, a few conclusions. So first, a little bit about non-destructive evaluation of concrete bridge decks and its automation. So I will first speak a little bit about the current practice and then we will go to the robotics. Uh, we do not have any kind of magic non-destructive technology, a single technology which can tell us all about the condition of bridge decks. Uh, if you look at this graph, which represents how the condition of a bridge deck changes with time, in most cases, uh, the primary cause of deterioration is corrosion. So what we would like to do is we would like to assess the state of corrosion, which typically involves evaluation of uh, what we describe as corrosive environment and also riba corrosion. Uh, and we also look into generation of cracks in that concrete for which we typically rely on acoustic methods. So you can see, for example, for riba corrosion, we have two methods which we use electrical resistivity, half cell potential, while, for example, for delamination, we use a uh, technology like impact echo. Uh, to fully appreciate the automation, the benefit of automation of non-destructive evaluation, I'm showing here you a slide how it looks like when we evaluate a bridge deck using manual technologies. So you can see a grid, which is typically two by two feet or 60 by 60 centimeters. And you can see that all of the technologies are applied simultaneously. But you can also see that it is labor intensive, so you need a team of five to six people. And you can also see that there is significant traffic interruption. So to give you a little bit closer idea how it looks like in the field, uh, we will just go very briefly through this video, which illustrates each of the technologies. The first one, electrical resistivity, which we are using to describe corrosive environment of concrete. So is it going to stimulate corrosion? The next technology, half cell potential, used to assess uh, probability of corrosion activity. So here we are speaking about actual corrosion in rebars. I have mentioned this, that uh, the next step in deterioration is development of delamination. Uh, so here you can see this is not a robot, this is, we can say, an automated system, we call it stepper. So what it does, uh, you will see like little balls hitting the surface of the bridge deck. So it is like a small sonar device. Once it applies an impact, those cylinders, which are sensors, they are recording the response and based on the response we know whether there are uh, shallow reflectors, which would be cracks. Another system for evaluation of delamination, this is called impact echo cane, and that is probably what we use the most for manual, manual condition assessment. Another technology, ground penetrating radar, electromagnetic method, 
uh, which we can describe is telling us um, a number of things, but uh, for none of those, we can say that we are perfectly sure. So it is more like the overall condition assessment. And finally, for evaluation of concrete quality, we use a system like this one. It uses method called ultrasonic surface waves. Uh, and by using this method, we are directly measuring concrete modulus. So instead of using uh, these series of manual devices, uh, what we have done is we have developed for Federal Highway Administration, uh, the system called Rabbit Robotics Assisted Bridge Inspection Tool, which integrates all of those non-destructive evaluation technologies. And you can see, um, for example, on the front end, you can see acoustic arrays, which include impact echo and ultrasonic surface wave methods. You see four uh, electrical resistivity probes. And you can also see on the front end, there are two digital cameras. So a little bit closer view of the front end. So you can see those acoustic arrays and connected electrical resistivity when a probes. So what is the advantage? You have seen, for example, a bad person going with the impact echo cane, uh, collecting data. For example, just one of those acoustic arrays contains uh, sensors and impactors, which are equivalent to eight impact echo devices and six ultrasonic surface wave devices. So together with both boxes, we can say we have equivalent to 16 impact echo devices and 12 surface wave. Uh, going to the rear end of the robot, you can see two ground penetrating radar arrays. Again, what you have seen with manual testing, it was a single antenna. Each of those boxes, GPR arrays has 16 antennas, or we can say um, eight pairs of antennas of dual polarization. Um, I have also mentioned this, that we are having um, two cameras on the front end of the robot, and they are, so to say, complementing uh, the non-destructive evaluation with visual inspection. You're going to see in the video the movement of the robot, but the robot was specifically designed to be six feet wide or 1.8 meters wide. Uh, so that with a single scan, it covers half of a driving lane. Uh, you will see in the video how it moves and that movement is fully autonomous. Uh, there is a command van, which is used to both transport the robot, but also to, so to say, uh, receive all the data collected by, uh, by the robot but also at the same time to control the movement of the robot. This is how the robot is being uh, transported. Uh, so you can see that those sensor arrays, they are foldable and a robot can, uh, so to say, uh, get out of the van using its own power while we use a cable to assist it a little bit to pull it in. So now you are going to see uh, the robot in operation. So it can move in prescribed increments. Uh, we typically use the same as we do for manual testing, which means it moves in uh, 0.6 meters increments. Uh, so as it stops, it attaches those sensor arrays to the bridge deck, collects the data, moves to the next point. In a second, you are going to see uh, what, it, what happens at the end of one survey lane. So once it is done, it rotates, it spins in the place, uh, translates to a new position and continues with data collection. All of this is fully autonomous. So there is nobody with a joystick uh, operating the robot. Everything was, uh, uh, everything was programmed uh, by using the, and uh, the navigation is done using uh, differential GPS. So here you can see one of the major benefits of uh, robotic data collection is that 
uh, you can say is that very often data collection is uh, in unsafe or very uncomfortable conditions. So just to illustrate some of the uh, results and benefits from stemming from ND surveys. So first you are going to see is that we can provide accurate description of internal deterioration of defects, uh, that we can provide very intuitive presentation of uh, what is happening. And uh, finally, for good bridge management, uh, non-destructive evaluation technologies or its results, uh, their results, they provide more realistic deterioration predictive modeling, which is essential for bridge management. So just to illustrate some of the results, uh, I will show results for this bridge in Virginia, which we surveyed four times. Um, so uh, during a period of six years. And here you can see, for example, condition maps, which we obtained using in one of those surveys, which we obtained using four different technologies. For example, at the top two uh, uh, plan, uh, those maps, they represent corrosion assessment from resistivity and half cell potential. Uh, the third map from the top, uh, the map from Impact Echo describing elimination assessment. And what you can see, all of those red colors or hot colors, they represent points where we have significant or serious deterioration. Another big advantage of use of NDE technologies is that by doing periodical surveys, we can capture deterioration progression. And here you can see, for example, for what we captured with electrical resistivity. So these red zones, they were progressing and uh, they were, uh, they were uh, become, becoming more severe. Uh, one of uh, the benefits of rabbit data collection is that those two cameras, they are collecting high resolution images of the deck surface. So instead of having inspectors doing visual inspection, now you are creating permanent records, which can be examined in the office. And on top, you can see so those images which are stitched together. Um, at the bottom, you can see the area A, which was enlarged. And on the next slide, you will see the area C at the joint. So you can very nicely examine uh, what was previously recorded. So how we can present this information, one of the ways how we can do it is by uh, for example, embedding this information into Google Earth. So if uh, you would like, for example, to see information or condition maps from previous surveys on this particular bridge. So this bridge is in Virginia, uh, maybe 30 miles from Washington, DC. Uh, you can already see from this Google Earth image that there are quite a few signs of previous repairs. Uh, what you might be noticing on the left side is that uh, I have just opened data collected in different, in those different surveys, so four surveys. And for example, right now, we will be viewing data from electrical resistivity, the very first survey, the second one, third one, and the fourth one. Then we can move to another technology to see how based on the results of this one, which is ground penetrating radar. And again, you can notice that there was very clear deterioration progression. So to save some time, let's go to the next slide. Another benefit of, for example, a condition assessment using those ND technologies is that the information is quantitative. And uh, what we are doing is we are calculating something what we call condition index. Uh, what you see in those colors, combined ND index. For example, for this bridge, you, we could very clearly capture degradation of the condition. So on the scale from zero to 100, where 100 is the best condition, we clearly captured deterioration progression. On the other hand, if you look at the last row of this table, which represents um, the rating based on in what you can find in National Bridge Inventory and which relies on visual inspection. 
during the same period, nothing changed. The number is six. So it really poses a problem to bridge managers how to predict what is going to happen in the next five or 10 years. So uh, the very last part, only two or three slides, is I will very briefly address uh, merging of robotic inspection and rehabilitation. So something what we have tried to address through one project uh, supported by NIST Technology Innovation Program is uh, early mitigation of delamination in bridge decks. So here you can see from extracted cores what delamination, how it looks like. So the whole idea is let us uh, again uh, uh, try to connect those two separated pieces of bridge deck. The current practice of whenever there is delamination in bridge deck, then it typically leads to removal of uh, the concrete. So the upper part, cleaning of rebars because they are probably corroded. And after that, uh, the displacement of new concrete. And as you can see, this is labor intensive. It is causing serious traffic interruptions and it has to be expensive. So as a part of this project, I'm not going to show videos and other materials, but uh, the, the whole idea is uh, we are doing all of these things too late. So since we have the ability using the other robot to detect problems at early stages, why don't we mitigate those problems also in their early stages? So what this project uh, was about, it was uh, about robotic rehabilitation, where we can say is there were three main parts. Uh, the first main part was related to material development. Uh, the second part was related to material delivery, de material delivery development. So how to inject this material into concrete bridge, uh, into this bridge deck. And finally, there was, um, uh, there was the third part, which was related to the accuracy of robot navigation. So what is our Overall view is, um, is that we should uh, look at the future and move from what is the current practice. So you can see on uh, the left side, what is the current practice of delamination detection? Uh, what is the practice of rehabilitation, which, take, which usually leads to uh, operations which are in days? which are very costly, which cause significant traffic interruptions. And finally, they pose risks to transportation workers. So instead of those, let us move to joint robotic inspection and rehabilitation, where we can say things would be not in days, will be in hours, cost will be significantly reduced. Uh, what is very important, similar like with our own health, we want to have early interventions we will minimize traffic interruptions. And finally, we will lower risks to transportation workers. So just a few conclusions is, um, I hope that uh, through these few minutes, I was able to them show that ND technologies can provide us, um, is a, a strong tools to provide us detailed and accurate information about condition in concrete bridge decks and through that, that they can provide us a better bridge management. Uh, second is uh, that uh, we do not have, what I mentioned at the very beginning is we do not have that miracle ND technology, which can give us all the answers. So we have to rely on multiple technologies. Um, what you saw on the previous slide is, so it, it is expected that automation robotics of ND will lead to significantly improved speeds of bridge deck surveys, that it will lead to safer data collection, and that it is going to produce effective multi-ND technology approach. And finally, what is like a vision is um, that minimally invasive and automated early intervention will be an integral part of future management of highway bridges. So with this, I thank you very much for your attention. Great. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Gusinski. Um, very interesting work uh, indeed. Um, okay, for the next presentation, we have Sina Karimi. Sina is an R&D specialist at Pomerlo, where he supports robotic application developments for implementation in Pomerlo's construction projects. 
Before joining Pomelo, he was an architect and also an assistant project manager involved in many projects where he focused on construction automation to achieve higher product productivity. See now, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ali, and all the presenters. Uh, first of all, do you see my screen? Yes, we do. Great. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm now going to talk about our experience of the use of robots in construction and how we use uh, robots on site. So uh, briefly, uh, I'm going to talk about the overall uh, the overall uh, view of the uh, robots on site, and then I'm going to go deeper into the autonomous vehicle that we use uh, on our job sites, uh, including the drones and then uh, autonomous vehicle, autonomous ground vehicles. And also, I'm going to talk about uh, one of our experience with the single task task construction robot, and then about uh, what we are looking ahead for future applications. So uh, as for the complete, uh, as for the robots on site, uh, I'd like to start with a broad overview of what the opportunities are in the construction industry. We are focused to use automation with robotics, trying to help with the problem to effectively monitor and manage our job sites. The level of comprehensive site visi uh, visibility requires unprecedented amount of reality capture and site data. The reality could uh, be captured in different ways, which requires various sensors. In addition, the frequency of captures are important as the visibility of sites requires consistent reality capture. So uh, why do we use robots? This is uh, a very legitimate question. The work is dull and extremely difficult for a human to do. For example, being able to take a photo or a laser scan at the same location at the same time of day with the same lighting condition day after day and after day is a difficult task to do. The people assigned to that level of reality capture are typically going to bring more value to the project by working on other things. With robots, we increase the amount and frequency of data collect, uh, capturing while decreasing the labor hours keeping everybody uh, focused on a higher value tasks on the job. When it comes to uh, fixed sensors uh, like cameras or other types of uh, sensors of that nature, there's a huge risk there. What if something uh, gets in the way? Also, uh, there needs to be many fixed sensors to cover the job site, while a few mobile sensors can take care of the job. The mobile sensors are really the key uh, to getting the job site data needed effectively. So uh, the autonomous robots automate uh, the site captures with high repeatability. Uh, we can increase the frequency of data capture, meaning that less change from capture to capture. Downstream analysis, uh, such as machine learning and computer vision tools used to process change detection will actually work more efficiently. That gives an answer to the need of some insight on the job site to make data-driven decisions. So uh, when it comes to the use of robots on job sites, the first thing is what is the right tool and how it can generate more value. A dynamic platform is always needed which can capture accurate data. Due to exclusive nature of construction projects, we should consider which tool fits the job. So the type of project is very important. Also, the current workflow works perfectly fine, and, and we need to see how we can fit and generate more value with robotics. The tool we use should be able to repeat the same uh, data capture as many times as we desire. So the tool needs to be uh, needs to have enough uh, uh, duration of autonomy to capture reality, and it needs to be compatible uh, to use various payloads. So uh, let's go through some of the applications we use and the ones that we are looking ahead. So first of all, uh, is the job site monitoring that we use to capture 360 uh, photo, usually once a week or twice a week. It depends on the project type, of course. We take these photos frequently over time to understand progress and deal with disputes. On the right, you can see how we use Spot, a product of Boston Dynamics, to capture and upload 360 images. We are going to go deeper into that. Uh, once uh, we record the path with robot, uh, we want to we want the robot to understand where we want the captures happen and spot autonomously captures once or twice a week. 
The photos are marked on the plan so that the project team knows uh, where exactly those 360 photos are taken. When we run spot day after day after day, the robot keeps capturing and uploading new 360 images. That enables our project team to understand the progress and monitor the site. We have many uh, projects working in and coordinating in 3D and BIM. They want to be able to uh, compare as built to the model. There are ways to do that. So uh, as you can see uh, on the screen, uh, the point cloud taken by Spot integrated with Leica RTC 360. And we've made this integration to use a highly accurate laser scanner with Spot. In this direction, uh, we also superimpose uh, the laser scan onto the model to get the deviation or any potential conflicts. We want to catch a point cloud against the model. We've been able to build a process where we collect the point cloud, import it into our software and visualize the deviation from model. Then we can see an element, if, it's, if an element is, in, is in, installed, if it's in the right place, or if it's in the, uh, or if there's any conflict with other elements of the job site. So this is uh, critical as it allows our projects to quantify the work and start to come up with a metric by which all stakeholders can agree upon in terms of indicating completion. So I cannot emphasize enough that first and foremost, uh, the robot gives an opportunity to remove workers from potentially hazardous situations. Think of confined spaces, but also think of spaces where it's easy to trip. Again, think of pre-port decking where some kinds of injuries could happen. We don't risk a person to do that level of data capture in that kind of train. On the right, uh, we have spot in the space where potential hazardous or dangerous situation could happen. We use spot with lights on the camera to identify the potential dangers from that reality capture and resolve them quickly so that they won't continue to be in danger. So when we use robots for data collection, it's not about capturing the data. It's also about the migration and how we use the data as well. We are looking at a typical data collection workflow from planning to action. Our robots help us in the first three steps, planning, capture, and transfer. And uh, so in this case, Spot, uh, we plan a mission for Spot. It captures the data and then transfer them to our experts. In this case, we also try to reduce the commute hour to generate higher efficiency in our processes. So let's go deeper to uh, what type of autonomous vehicles we use for data collection. First of all is drones. Uh, employing drones uh, provides us a reliable monitoring and surveying system that can be established to obtain accurate, timely, and trustworthy data. Drones are often furnished with high quality sensors for versatile purposes high resolution cameras and various high level components and software. After data collection, the information is then processed and analyzed through advanced software for uh, in enhanced operations, preparations and improvements. Drones provide data for 3D creations and uh, are the mosaic maps of the construction site. Topography enables seizing specific site maps, including counters, trains, and to be systematically captured, updated, and collected as online maps for convenient inspection of objects. Aerial photography also are often used to provide clients with compelling and essential visuals of the construction site and how it will be in future. 3D models are also enable uh, uh, detailed representation of the constructor's vision and, and can conveniently be viewed online. As the project continues to embody the constructor's vision, it is crucial to develop regular flights uh, over and around the construction site for real-time progress monitoring. This data assists developers, stakeholders, and other engaging in the process of construction. Uh, also, uh, aerial uh, photogrammetry warrants uh, seizing extensive areas with high accuracy. Uh, the volumetric measurements are not uh, just highly accurate, but also quick to capture, cost efficient, and very convenient as they do not disrupt day-to-day -day operations on job sites. Uh, so now we're going to move on to uh, some of our ground vehicles that we use uh, on a construction site. Uh, we collaborated with a university in Montreal to use an autonomous rover uh, on our construction site. We targeted the semantic till operation. 
integration with BIM and also how we can circle back the data to BIM for downstream analysis. The project, this project uh, uses BIM and GIS to help the robot understand the spatial structure and topographical environment in an autonomous navigation uh, on a construction site. Uh, this was a project that was done uh, in the collaboration with the university in Montreal. Uh, so before I jump deeper into SPOT, uh, I'm pretty sure that everybody has met SPOT, but I'm gonna uh, give a brief overview uh, of how this uh, uh, agile mobile uh, platform works. So uh, SPOT automates our onsite data capture by which of that level of repeatability, we are able to increase the frequency of data capture. Increased frequency also, uh, means the less change from capture to capture. Therefore, our downstream uh, BIM-based analysis will work more efficiently. Now, uh, let's go deeper and have a look at how actually SPOT captures accurate data. So this is uh, a demonstration of how SPOT works. Uh, we already provided uh, a path to the robot so that it can know where to go and where to capture the data. SPOT is equipped with uh, various sensors, as you can see on the top. Uh, it can carry up to 14 kilograms of uh, payloads, which is great. We uh, equip SPOT with uh, RGBD camera, 3D laser scanner, which is uh, a product of uh, Leica, uh, a 360 uh, camera, and also uh, a computer on board and the LiDAR uh, for effective data collection and also effective navigation on the job site. So when a spy is navigating the environment, uh, it can go and also detect any QR code or any other information that is uh, attached to the job site. So that's how we implement it with the use of AI. So when a spy detects the QR code, goes to a stabilization mode, and we use this mode to have less noise in our laser scans. When a spot is uh, uh, stabilized, it gives the command uh, to the RTC360. And uh, when RTC starts uh, generating the point cloud spot, stand still so that uh, we have less noise in the point cloud. So you can see that how the point cloud is generated and uh, we, we can achieve uh, accurate and high, uh, high precision of uh, data with this laser scanner. Uh, spot also comes with a robust SDK so that we can actually uh, customize, uh, customize uh, the application to our needs. So when the scan is completed, uh, we can repeat this task as many times as we desire. There is no limitation for that. So in this uh, video, I'm showing you uh, a couple of examples of how we generate the data. So in this case, we can address the limitation of a manual uh, reality capture, which is labor, uh, labor intensive and cost ineffective. And also we can eliminate unproductive hours of the human while uh, the sensor is working. So again, SPOT goes to a stabilization mode, locks the joints so that we have less noise and then we can uh, generate the data. Uh, the thing is at the same time, at the same location, we can generate different, uh, uh, we, can generate we can generate data with different sensors. For example, you can see we have a laser scanner, we have RGBD camera, and also we have a 360 photo. So in the same location, we have various types of data so that uh, our downstream analysis would work more eff effectively. When the scan is completed, a spot continues the mission as we desire. So this is uh, the benefit that a mobile platform would bring for data acquisition on a job site. Also, uh, since it's an agile mobile, uh, there is no limitation in terms of uh, uh, traversing uh, uh, stairs, which provides us more, uh, more autonomy. As we talked about the analysis, when we collect the data with the spot uh, or with the robot, uh, what do we want to do with it? So we are going to go and uh, put it into our software for further analysis. So in this case, we are looking uh, at one of our software here so that we 3D reconstructed uh, the point cloud and then we superimpose onto the model so that we can get the deviation. The deviation is visualized as you can see here. Uh, so in this case, we have a pipeline from capture to analysis. So we capture, uh, we plan, we capture, uh, we transfer, 
and then we analyze uh, automatically so that uh, our expert can uh, be focused more on higher added value tests. Uh, also, uh, for now, we are using uh, uh, the current workflows uh, uh, that we have in our company, and we can get the deviation from them so that the project team can have a better insight of uh, what's going on on the job site. So uh, now we're going to uh, have like a detour in our presentation and have a look at a single task robot that uh, we use in one of, one of our job sites. So here is JBot, another robot, uh, uh, which is uh, which is the kind of semi-autonomous robot. It can drill uh, overhead uh, instead of a human because you know if a human wants to uh, drill it, first of all, it has less productivity than a robot, and then also there is danger in that case. So the human has to go up on a scissor lift. In this case, we are not removing any humans. Instead of going on a scissor leaf, they can focus on setting up the robot and then sending commands to it. So it can provide us higher productivity in anchoring and installation. Also, we have higher accuracy of work uh, because of the uh, uh, localization system. And in this case, since the work is work is uh, focused on uh, other tasks, we reduce safety hazards. Uh, the beauty of the solution is that it's being integrated. So there is no uh, further uh, uh, effort to, to make this integration happen. So when we have the BIM, we can, uh, the robot reads the, the location of all the holes and then goes and also drills the above job site. Uh, as a look ahead, uh, we are going, we are in the process of development of a robot uh, robotic command center POM RCC, uh, which we want to uh, remotely manage and access to the fleet of our robots. So imagine that someone is staying at home and they can uh, reach out to the robot and send uh, uh, commands to the robot. In this case, there is no need to put on remote or dangerous sites. And we can teleoperate and review data in real time so that we do not have to wait for the data to circle back to our software. And when we, and when we see the data in real time, we can capture it. This uh, platform will support a collaboration from different uh, operators on the job site. Uh, as a final note, uh, I would like to uh, thank you all for your attendance here. Uh, and we can discuss more in the Q&A period. Great, uh, thank you so much, Sina. Uh, very interesting. And there are some questions that we'll get to um, later from the chat. Um, so uh, we now have our panel discussion on opportunities and challenges of robotics in construction from an industrial perspective. Uh, before getting into the panel discussion, we're going to launch the Zoom poll that I talked about before. So please uh, participate in the poll and um, mark your top areas of interest for the next seminars, both in the area of robotics and also digitalization. Uh, we will share the results uh, at the end of the session. For the panel discussion I am uh, and the q and I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Mazdaq Nikbach. Dr. Nikbach is an associate professor in the Department of Building, Civil and Environmental Engineering at Concordia University. And he's also a co-director of CSIM. Uh, over to you, Mazdaq. Thank you very much, Ali. Um... Absolutely amazing presentations from all the panelists. I'm going to start the, the, the poll now. Uh, I'm launching it. Um, I'm gonna uh, basically wait for about a minute for everybody to get the chance to take a look at the questions and uh, pick the topics that they're more interested in. As it was mentioned by Ali and others, this is just the beginning of uh, hopefully series of talks on automation, digitalization and robotics in construction. There are two questions that you hopefully can see. Ali, can you confirm that you can see the yeah, uh, poll? we can see two questions. Awesome. Okay, so um, we're asking, we're basically thought of um, a few topics under digitalization, a few topics under robotics, and want to know which ones are of more interest uh, for our following, uh, basically, workshops and seminars and panels. Um, so please feel free, it would remain open for a few minutes. Um, but please feel free to contribute. I'll share the results at the end of this uh, panel today. 
Um, you will also receive a follow-up um, after this session today uh, that will give you, again, the chance of uh, selecting the topics that you find more interesting. So uh, with that, we can move on to the panel discussion. The way it would work is uh, we're going to open up, um, basically break the ice by um, asking a question, a general question about the adoption of robotics and uh, on the job sites. I'm going to question every um, uh, one of our panelists um, about the barriers and urgent needs for adoption of robotics into the job site. I think we heard in almost all of the presentations that uh, robotics for construction job sites has a lot more potentials and apparently they are not um, being used uh, to, the, to the best that they can. So I wanna ask, why do you think that's the case? And what do you think is the immediate, immediate need for basically adding into the adoption rate of robotics in the job site. I'm going to ask the same question in the reverse order um, that the speakers appeared. And I would really appreciate if uh, you could uh, basically um, give the answer shortly in two minutes to maximum three minutes so that we can get more time to entertain a few questions from the floor. Meanwhile, uh, the audience, please continue putting your questions on the chat box. Uh, we're bundling them together to ask uh, the panelists. So I'm gonna start with uh, Sina. Uh, do you wanna give us your opinion? Yeah, in my opinion, as for the immediate needs, uh, there is a huge labor shortage and uh, the robots can fill in this gap uh, by, product, by providing uh, more productivity to the construction job sites. Uh, also, in terms of barrier, I'm thinking about uh, that each technology has its own limitations. So that the, the contractor side and the client side, they should understand uh, what are the limitations of a tool and how they are going to address that limitation. Let's say that for a, uh, for a drone, the more, the, they're more focused on the outdoors for data collection of uh, large job sites while uh, ground robotic, uh, robots can, uh, can collect data inside the building and for indoors. So uh, in this case, if you wanna have the, the data from outdoors and indoors, we can uh, have an integrated system so that uh, we can use both UAVs and UGVs uh, for data collection. Great. Thank you so much for the uh, brief and uh, an elaborate answer. So I'm going to move on to uh, Dr. Guchomsky. Um, so maybe from the viewpoint of uh, condition assessment, what are the main barriers in the industry for deployment? Um, well, how I would describe is that uh, certainly there are tremendous opportunities for bringing robotics into uh, bridge inspection. And uh, since I concentrated on speaking about uh, inspection of concrete bridge decks, I was looking into various kinds of data. But for example, in the US, I would estimate that every year about five to $10 billion are being spent on uh, repairs and rehabilitation of concrete bridge decks. And we certainly could say is that uh, we probably could save significant amount of money if we could uh, better manage those bridges by having better condition assessment. Right now, the practice is that, uh, that uh, uh, bridge decks are being uh, assessed using non-destructive evaluation technologies only when, uh, let's say, bridge owners are preparing to have major repairs, major rehabilitation. They are not being used for, for example, peri periodical condition assessments so that uh, bridge owners can develop reliable pred predictive models. And based on those models, they plan for activities. Uh, one of, um, so from that point, uh, I would say absolutely. Uh, I mentioned US probably on the order of five to $10 billion is being spent on rehabilitation repairs. And I'm confident that by having more accurate condition assessment, we would be saving at least 10 to 20%, which means like maybe one to $2 billion a year through improved assessment. That's, that's amazing uh, in terms of opportunities. Why do, do you think it's not happening? What are the major, uh, and what is the major need for, for it to happen the next day? 
Well, uh, you know, something what I I have spoken at several conferences and uh, what I'm trying to do is where we have this community of bridge owners, um, researchers, uh, service providers and so on. I'm trying to tell them is uh, we are in this all together and we have to work together. And what we need to do is we need to find paths how to do investments into development of new technologies in uh, the case of inspection of, con of bridges, in the development of non-destructive evaluation technologies, which are also uh, not just more comprehensive, but also more rapid. Uh, we need to uh, develop into, uh, invest into robotics. Once we have invested, mm -hmm. um, it is going to also lead to, uh, to those equipment manufacturers. They will be they will be interested in investing into new robotic systems uh, because this will demonstrate that there is interest from bridge owners. And finally, if we uh, develop new equipment, it is going to lead to service providers who are at the moment using what you may say manual and semi-automated technologies. They will be buying those technologies and provide service to bridge owners so that they will be able to manage uh, manage their bridges in better ways with less money. And that is why I'm saying is like, we have to reach some kind of consensus I see. Uh, I that see. Um, the investment is needed. And through, let's say five years or 10 years, we are all going to see benefits. So, so basically it's a complex uh, network of stakeholders and everybody must be on board and do take their own shares. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm moving on to Ramkin. Aramti, you mentioned a few of the challenges and uh, what your company is trying to address, the gap that you're trying to bridge. Um, so how do you look at it uh, from your own point of view? What are the main barriers? No, I don't think, uh, I mean, if you're thinking about just the on-site uh, incorporation of robotics, I don't think there's going to be one answer sort of a fits all. Uh, I think, you know, uh, you know, construction is going to be quite diverse. We've got a lot of subsectors within construction to, to a great degree. I think, I think some part of uh, construction sector, if you have infrastructure maybe, and maybe, uh, you know, some of the other industrial that might be, you know, faster in developing some of these things, because I think there's just a higher degree of sophistication maybe in, in terms of deploying of technology with, you know, assets that have a sort of a longer term payback. Uh, when you compare that, for example, to residential side, which is it has a very different type of market where you're trying to sell to the consumer uh, and typically has had a lower level of technology adoption. So I think that's one way to look at it as a factor. And the second part I think about it, I try to not think about it so much in terms of uh, the capabilities of technology. I think technology has a lot of opportunity already, as, as you've seen from a lot of the speakers today. And actually, if you look at venture investment, it has doubled in the construction sector just in the past decade. And I sort of see that continuing to, to, to explode because I think every, all of a sudden the investment community recognized this is a, a pretty big sector with low productivity. So that's where the next disruption needs to come. However, I think the part where we have a lot of still work to do is a training of the workforce and the training of the sector. I think that's an area, particularly university and colleges need to sort of a, a, a sort of a up the game to, to really think about what is that future of workforce is going to look like and how do we actually help the sector to think differently about the problem and how to address that problem and develop the workforce to really think about what is technology enabled workforce of the future look like. I see uh, that's that's actually a quite quite important point and uh, the idea that of course one one solution won't fit all is is very i think valid point here Do, does uh, promise robotics have uh, any analysis of rois because this is one of the questions uh, from the audience as well um that justifies this upfront investment in different types different sectors or subsectors and uh, can you do you have any quick answer for us, maybe in a couple of seconds? Uh, what is the most or least, uh, basically, um, meaningful applications? Well, our focus right now, Promise Robotic, is really on the residential, right? So, so that's really where we have done a lot of our analysis for, for the KPIs and paybacks and all of those things. And as I mentioned, a 
one of, one of the things we're also focused on is looking at a different business model where if we could actually remove the capital barrier and actually expand that as a sort of a service model over the lifespan with having a very short payback time for the investment that uh, a company could make. So our whole goal has been, you don't need to be a big builder to access these technologies. And that's really what we're trying to push where you don't need to build 800 homes or you know thousand homes to be able to afford this. Even if you are doing you know, 150, <laughs> you should be able to be able to access this. And that's really where we have sort of put a lot of our core emphasis, trying to turn the economics of this through a combination of changing the technologies through the smart sort of a robotics, but also looking at sort of a, what software business has done for a, sort of a long time ago by bringing the SaaS model and looking at the value generation over time, not as a just sort of a one-off transaction uh, with a customer. So those are th things where our head of space is and we're continuing to develop and we want to experiment with. Thank you so much, Ramtin. Uh, before moving to the next the panelist, I want to just uh, mention again, I received uh, 68 responses on the poll in case you didn't get the chance to complete it, please complete. Um, after the first round uh, questions, I'll share the results. Um, so let's move on to, to Dr. Amin Hamad. Um, Dr. Amin, how do you look at the problem? So if you allow me to share my screen, I prepared one slide about this. Mm -hmm. Okay, so do you see my screen? Uh, yes. Okay. So actually, I I will start with the. Uh, we don't we don't look at the rights. Yeah. Thank you. The ROI. So the low ROI actually is one the, perhaps of the main uh, barriers. Uh, most tasks that we discuss today can be automated. Uh, that can be automated are cheaper for labor to perform. I have this data from McKinsey. So this is the automation potential versus wage for U.S. jobs. This is for all types of trades and I extracted the ones that are more related to construction. So even for crane operators, as you can see, the wage uh, is not so high. Uh, so actually, as uh, also uh, it was mentioned in uh, the presentation of Dr. Musilhi, maybe the, uh, the robot, uh, robot economics alone uh, could be challenging and the use of robotics could be more justified if we have combination of worker safety, efficiency, and quality. So we can have, for example, improvement in efficiency when we use robotic excavation, because at the same time, we are doing real-time surveying. Or we can uh, have some tasks that could be difficult for the human labor to do. For example, contour crafting that could be done easily with 3D printing. The other aspect is the nature of current construction processes, where we have uh, the complexity of construction uh, site conditions. Uh, we have chaotic sites, for example, if we compare with the mining industry, they are uh, much more advanced in using robotics because their sites are more organized and they have more control, of course. The other aspect is low level of standardization. So we have more and more usage of BIM uh, in construction projects, but in order to use robots, we need to have accurate and up-to-date uh, BIM model that uh, can be used by robots. We have also the limited coordination between stakeholders. We have large number of uh, contractors and subcontractors, and they have to really have very good coordination in order to use robots, uh, for example, to improve safety also, to, to make sure that there are no accidents when we use robots, and also to consider security issues. And there's a lot of recent research about cyber physical security, uh, for example, for safe driving cars. We don't want these robots to be hacked. Uh, other means I summarized in the remaining bullets, for example, uh, to overcome these challenges, we need to think about process re-engineering, uh, robot-oriented design, and even material robot systems. So these are uh, interrelated concepts. We have to adjust the process to fit with the usage of robots. We may have to change the design to be more uh, applicable for robotic execution, and also even change the material that are used. For example, I mentioned uh, in one of my slides about the uh, material that, that's used for bricklaying uh, to replace mortar. And also the same thing can be said for uh, concrete 3D printing. We have also the human-robot collaboration. So uh, in the near future, we have to imagine that robots will be working side by side with human workers and uh, how we can do that. In fact, there's a lot of research happening in this area. And the last uh, idea is about decentralized control and robot coordination. Uh, as I mentioned in one slide in Shimizu, they have a team of robots and this team, uh, th these robots have to coordinate and communicate with each other. So this is a quick uh, idea about things to be done and, and the uh, barriers to be overcome. 
quick and comprehensive. Thank you so much, Dr. Amin. Uh, so maybe last but not least, um, Dr. Mselhi. Um, yeah, I will. I will share one slide if please. I can, and I think it would be. Um, Um, I meanwhile, I just uh, remind the audience in case you have questions. We've received already a lot of good questions that we'll entertain in a minute. Uh, if you have more questions, please feel free to go and uh, put them in the chat box. You see my slide? Yes, we do. Okay, I'll expand that then. Yeah. Uh, like I said, it's good uh, actually. Okay, perfect. No, oh, it's perfect. Well, it's really that in a nutshell. Number one, I think uh, all the speakers have really highlighted that, and this is almost a kind of a summary to what uh, most of the participants now have heard. As to the challenges, uh, the number one thing is really the upfront cost. This is something that uh, it all depends on the nature of the application. So I could tell you, for example, when we look at the um, the field factory, this is a, a major investment. And this is why uh, in terms of return on that or benefits from that, uh, your league for high rise buildings, it really need to be high rise building, really high rise. We're looking about at least uh, something more than 15 stories or more in order just to save something and see how well we can even compress the, the schedule. Um, the training and some of the speakers also have referred to that. Uh, the human and equipment interaction, I think Dr. Uh, uh, Hamed have referred to that uh, eloquently. Uh, but very important thing is management. Sometimes we forget that uh, um, top management really need to buy into the idea of automation and robotics. But also you need, as I think uh, uh, Ms. Attar have referred to that or uh, Mr. Karimi, I can't recall, is really the training of the individuals, the people that will come to work in that environment. So you need the bottom up and top down in order for this really to work down. It's just a question. And number one uh, and most important is the top management, because if they do not believe in the thing, I don't think this will fly. Um, uh, the issue also of material. Sometimes you think, oh yeah, I can have the mortar and then the brick laying, you know, from where that mortar will come? What type of mortar will come? And what are the limitations for its use? Really the supply and also power supply on site. The uh, issue of integration is, is a major thing. And you've heard that from Dr. Hamad, not only um, more than one robots, particularly when you look at, and we said that, uh, for example, the field factory, more than one robot will work on the construction of one floor. So these are uh, major issues. Another thing is really economics. And uh, in, in a study that we have carried out here, and I had a really a bright master thesis student who did early work on uh, slab on grid construction. Just we need to, to automate the screening uh, to some level. And we found only one contractor in Quebec who was at that time uh, doing that. Uh, and then with a cement floor finisher robot, then uh, the, the idea here, you need, you, you need to have a volume of business uh, for a contractor to be maybe uh, one and a half million uh, square foot uh, in order to do something like that. And you say, uh, yes, economically it is feasible for me. Another thing really for the challenges, we need to have uh, successful cases. People will report, for example, Pomerlo will report, uh, uh, other, uh, uh, you know, um, um, uh, Promise Robotics will report, uh, you know, owners of major construction companies that, that really are uh, embracing and investing in this level of automation report something, yeah, even brief, uh, so they could uh, highlight the problems, they could highlight the benefits that they have seen. In terms of opportunities, I couldn't agree more with Professor Gupniski because I've also worked in that field with many of the grad students, particularly on um, inspection of reinforced concrete bridges and rehabilitation, particularly as he referred to the integrated condition assessment and rehabilitation. This is a really a very promising field that we can, another major thing really we could rethink construction. The, it really is an invitation to rethink construction. And I think to some degree, Dr. Hamad have referred to design for robotics and uh, the issue of quality. And uh, so these are, uh, uh, but I could see impact on GDP, 
I could see on opportunities. I could see on in integrating women into the uh, construction business. I could see really the issue of EDI uh, very clear in, in the opportunity side. I will stop here. Thank uh, you very much. Thank you very much. That was really more than happy to address questions. Thanks a lot. Um, so maybe we can um, go back if you, perfect. Um, I'm gonna, we have about 10 minutes. I apologize in advance in case we uh, go a little bit beyond, beyond the time. Thank you very much, Ali, for sharing this. So as you see on the screen, the results of uh, the poll are out. We will continue um, basically following up with the attendance and the ones who showed interest in our uh, series. I see that so far under the um, digitalization, automated uh, detection and management of construction processes, um, high interest there, uh, followed by a few more. And on the right-hand side, under robotics, we see that um, robotics for on-site construction, um, followed by human-robot interaction are the ones that uh, the audience showed interest. We will uh, plan, starting from tomorrow, for our next, uh, basically, um, workshop to, to address these one after the other. Uh, thank you very much, Eddie. So uh, maybe we can uh, now proceed into the questions that we received. I started with Sina because we didn't hear much from him and uh, most of the questions, I mean, at least two questions from the audience are for, for Sina. So Sina, uh, the question is, the first question I wanna bring up is about the comparison between data acquisition manually or through human versus using the spot. Um, for, like as a business case, using any of the business KPIs and looking at it through this uh, this lens, has Comerlo have any type of assessment on comparison between the two cases? Uh, yes, uh, we have we have a project that uh, we used a manual uh, data collection. A human can go there, and also versus spot, and we extracted KPIs for that, and I can. Uh, Named the uh, the KPIs, which is uh, the time of uh, a human has to commute to the project, so, but uh, the robot is there, so uh, we eliminate unproductive hours here, uh, and also uh, the carbon radiation because uh, the person has to go to the job site, and that's how we can contribute uh, to a greener environment. Also, uh, when the sensor is working. Uh, the, uh, the operator needs to wait until the sensor is done and then move it to the next location. So while they are waiting, there is an unproductive uh, amount of time that they are uh, spending while the sensor is working. And this operation can take hours, you know, can take a day to collect uh, the data. So since we have Spot there, Spot can go autonomously and collect the data. And if the, the battery, uh, uh, falls uh, under a certain threshold, it goes back to its docking station, which where it can charge itself wirelessly. And then when it's fully charged, it goes back and uh, continues the job. So uh, in this case, uh, the person doesn't have to stay there. He can go and work on higher added value tasks. Uh, in the comparison that we did, we also emphasize on the accuracy of the data. We wanted to know uh, how the, uh, if the data is accurate as enough to be used for different applications. Uh, one of the applications that, that I'm talking about is floor flatness. The other one is floor levelness and also progress monitoring. Uh, the, the highest value that, uh, that Spot brings is where we are going to capture data repeatedly. So this data can be laser scans for the deviation from model and also it can be 360 images for site documentation and monitoring. Uh, Imagine that every week that a human has to go on the job site and they need to spend the whole day to, to capture all the data. While we can have a robot collect the data and then uh, transfer it into the cloud autonomously. And in this case, we found up to 40% of a higher efficiency using Spot. Okay, thank you. And uh, maybe very quick follow-up uh, among the questions uh, from the audience. Um, did you face any issues with uh, navigation of a spot on the site, particularly given the dynamic uh, nature of the construction site? So if you can briefly address the, if there were any issues, any challenges or problems there. Uh, 
or or it was very smooth as they advertised. <laughs> uh, uh, Spot has uh, its own limitation. One of the, the limitations is that it cannot detect transparent material. So let's say if, the, if there is like a glass wall there, Spot cannot detect it because the laser beams goes through uh, glass and transparent material. So this is one limitation. Uh, also, in terms of navigation, uh, I haven't seen um, any major uh, problem with that. Uh, I found Spot designed for a dynamic place. So if there is like an uh, obstacle there, with the obstacle, with the built-in obstacle avoidance algorithm, Spot can uh, easily go over the obstacle or turn around the obstacle and get to the location. At some time, let's say that I want Spot to go at a certain location to, to capture data for me. And that location is obstructed. So the operator gets a notification and Spot start asking, there is an obstacle there, I cannot go. Do you want me to go uh, close enough to collect data or do you want me to skip? So this is uh, a decision that, uh, that the operator needs to take. And based on that, uh, we can capture reliable and uh, accurate data. Thank you very much, uh, Sina. I'm gonna proceed with the next question um, and asking uh, Professor Gukinski to, uh, to address this. Um, the question is about the inspection of iteration for non-flat or elevated surfaces, um, such as the elevated um, outdoor um, subway decks and so on and so forth. Um, is there anything uh, equivalent or similar to, to Rabbit to do that? We do not have systems yet uh, for, so to say, non-flat, non-horizontal surfaces. Um, there have been some attempts and um, uh, one of the primary problems with uh, robotic systems for concrete surfaces is how to have adhesion to the surface. And some systems, for example, they relied on uh, vacuum, but uh, once you apply vacuum, there are some problems uh, which are related to that um, uh, having vacuum, it typically leads also to generation of noise, which is affecting uh, results of some of the technologies. Um, I was just responding uh, to one of the questions, uh, for example, related to tunnels. Uh, so at the moment, for example, for tunnels, we are more relying on, so to say, remote sensing which does not require contact. So, and if that is the case, for example, um, uh, we can do surveys from vehicles. Uh, some of the technologies which can apply to this, uh, this way is in addition to, let's say, LIDARs, imaging, we can, on a non-destructive evaluation side, uh, like infrared tomography can be uh, deployed. Also as air coupled system, there are ground penetrating radars. So there are some technologies uh, which can provide assessment of those. But we are working on robots, which would also allow us to, uh, to, uh, develop, to deploy ND technologies, which would be ultimately contact technologies. And, and are these like, for example, GPR and so on, are they integrated in robots yet? We see a lot about the um, laser scanning, the digital imaging, and so how about uh, other technologies? Uh, well, um, uh, yes. And I would say it's probably GPR would be one technology where we would feel more comfortable um, uh, because um, uh, that one would be, for example, if we are speaking about robots which are using vacuums or other ways how to uh, secure or provide adhesion to, to the surface, uh, they would be less affected by, uh, by noise of, uh, let's say, very vacuum devices. We have, for example, tried to do some uh, testing on, uh, on uh, inclined surfaces, actually, you may say, on the border with Canada on uh, Niagara Dam uh, with a robotic system where we have used uh, what are called in, uh, air coupled acoustic systems. So to look for delamination. Uh, and uh, that particular robot using vacuum uh, uh, was using vacuum and was climbing on, uh, you may say, inclined surface, not vertical, but inclined. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, moving 
to the next question. I'm going to ask this uh, from, from team, but maybe everybody else can uh, add if they have any opinions or comments. Um, I'm trying to bundle two questions and that's about the uh, basically liabilities and liabilities relate as related to the safety risks, um, unauthorized accesses, um, on the one hand, on the other hand, what if things go wrong? What, what if there are mechanical failures, uh, control errors, and so um, who would be considered liable and how do we have any basic standards in place? Um, how these issues are handled as we speak? And maybe Ramtin, you can answer another one um, slightly related to this, and that's about the um, labor, I mean, labor being replaced by the robot. I think that's the question, one of the first questions that come to, to the mind. So what happens to the uh, basically uh, employment and are there any challenges or risks there? Maybe you can answer these two. So I think uh, we, could, we could have a whole other talk on sort of the labor dynamics and all of those things. <laughs> right, yeah. uh, just, right. So on the safety side, yeah, I mean, sort of the safety is not only uh, just on the mechanical side. There's also, you know, we spend a lot of time thinking about data side, right? Like we are using AI, right? We're creating a cloud-based systems for managing the entire production workflow as a sort of an enterprise solution to be able to actually pass data right to the robot in a distributed manufacturing environment. Uh, so all of those things are sort of the things that we actually spend time thinking about. Uh, it goes beyond my own sort of a technical sort of understanding to really tell you about what, how we are technically addressing some of this, but uh, essentially, you know, as, as from a point of view of how we're building soft uh, safety measures, how we are sort of a baking that into our software, into our robot control, and all of those things. And again, no understanding that uh, location to location could be a little bit different. Right now, we are, op we are just uh, operationalizing our first light robotic factory in Alberta, which has a very different safety measures and sort of a, sort of a labor dynamics than you know, Ontario. Uh, so all of those things is certainly uh, both on the software and uh, uh, hardware side is, is going to this. Uh, as far as Promise Robotic goes, again, we're trying to be a technology provider. So our, you know, we're trying to provide the technology with the right safety mechanisms and all the sort of a things not to be the cons manufacturer, right? So I think there's a, there's a bit of a separation there where as a manufacturer, you have other form of liabilities and safety checks that we need to do. Uh, however, we're trying to automate that as much as we can through computer vision and some of the other quality measurements so forth. Uh, the second question you ask, uh, I skipped a lot of my slides on the labor side. Uh, now that makes me think I should have actually included those. Uh, I, I look at it in, in a sort of a three different scale. First of all is we are more automated than any time in the human history. And yet we have created more jobs than ever. And we're at the lowest uh, employment rate in, in our economy. So, so that's sort of the broader stroke. Uh, automation and things doesn't necessarily mean it's a good job. And there are a lot of interesting economics uh, uh, writing on this part. On the construction particularly, we're also at one of the time, a very interesting times uh, in the history of construction where we're seeing, not only we're seeing one of the lowest labor shortages in, in, in sort of what we're trying to do, but also we're seeing a very interesting shift in, in the skills that are required for the future. Uh, it's as far as, you know, we're seeing sort of a, a, a very drop in percentage in the manual work. A lot of the colleges that I talk to, they say they're having a hard time to have an inflow of new talent to come and want to work in these sort of a jobs. Uh, we have a lack of diversity in, in our job force. And uh, we also have a, just a tremendous need for the new labor that is not out there. So definitely there's gonna be some displacement, there's gonna be some changes, but I think at the end of the day, when you look at the overall impact, you're essentially gonna end up with a much better paying job that is safer, it's in a much sort of a safer environment, is much more stable, but essentially you know, it's, it's just different from how we decided to do this. And a good example of that is a bank teller. You know, before, once we put the, all the bank teller machines in the banks, the nature of the job changed. Now that a lot of the people who work in the bank, they focus on customer service. They don't spend a lot of time doing sort of a, a small scale transactions to, to process your checks and so forth. So I think construction needs to go through that phase if we are serious about productivity and net zero future. Right, right. That's a good, uh, good, good point. Actually, that's a good uh, synergy. And I think uh, what Dr. Hamad referred to as process re-engineering for 
basically automated uh, will be very related. Um, it's 2.06, we're trying to wrap up in four minutes. I'm gonna uh, leave these uh, as two minutes and two minutes to Dr. Amin Haman, and Dr. Sam Selhi to basically um, shed some light on some of the questions that were asked. Um, and with that, we'll, uh, we'll basically wrap up. So maybe we can start with uh, Dr. Hamad and we, we wrap up with yeah. Dr. himself. Thank you. <clears throat> Actually, I see one question from Dr. Minglu. Uh, any examples for robots-oriented design for construction in industry yet? In fact, maybe the easiest answer is to refer to uh, modular construction. Uh, for example, at University of Alberta, Dr. Al Hussein has been doing a lot of work related to how to develop beam models that are readily available for uh, manufacturing and even for panel fabrication uh, that will apply. And the other side of it is that these elements could be reversibly, reversibly uh, deconstructed and could be reused somewhere else. So that could be also linked to another benefit of uh, using robots and automation, which is related to sustainability. This is my short answer. Thank you so much. And um, Dr. Musali. Yes. I. Um... I really, before I say anything, I just like to thank uh, very much uh, uh, Professor uh, um, Yasser Mohammed, who have initiated this whole issue of collaboration between what we do at Concordia and the uh, University of Alberta. And also would like to thank Ali. Uh, he worked with us uh, uh, in order to make this uh, thing happen. As to the question of uh, labor replacement, there is something very promising in the use of robot robotics in construction for labor assisted and labor freeing labor from accidents. One example that may be already presented today um, uh, is the um, uh, gypsum board uh, when you place them or even plywood when if you're in, in a residential construction. These are heavy things. You could see a robot assisted a human. So, there is a beautiful area where you are going to uh, utilize human and robot assisted uh, uh, construction operations where the material handling part, the difficult part uh, um, uh, that could be injurious to um, the labors could be eliminated and you focus only on the quality of execution. So I think there is a promise if we use the, te the technology by itself, it needs human being to think about it. How we're gonna use it? What would be the best? I think uh, uh, Sinai said that in the in the early going, how best or maybe also uh, um, uh, Mr. Attar uh, referred to that. Uh, value, you just not only, this is a piece of equipment you're gonna spend some money on, uh, I want to get the best value for it, best value for my own workers, for the work environment, for encouraging the sector to grow, for the benefits that Dr. Bukriski have referred to in billions of dollars. If you really automate and 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 reduce accidents, uh, increase the volume of business, and also I can tell you there is a huge show. How many? Six hundred thousand bridges, uh, Dr. Bukriski. Uh, how you don't even have the labor force if you wanted even to do the traditional inspection. So this is something that we really have to cope up with. So I, uh, once again, I'd like to thank all the participants today who have been, without them, we would not have that uh, particular seminar. I'd like thank to thank you, you Dr. Hamad, for uh, what, the major contribution that you did in, in the background, in the scenes in the back, and also Dr. Uh, Nick Bath, who already coordinated that, Dr. Yasser Mohammed, and definitely the, uh, the speakers who accepted the invitation to come and share their valuable time and experience with our audience today. Thank you all very much. I have thank you so to... much, Dr. Maselhi. I also want to thank all the presenters, the panelists, uh, Dr. Maselhi, Dr. Hamad, Dr. Ukinski, uh, Mr. Attar, and um, Mr. Karimi. It was... Uh, it was, very, it was a pleasure listening to you. Very insightful talks and very insightful, basically, presentations. Special thanks, of course, goes to Ali, who basically um, conducted the show, orchestrated everyone. Ali, great job. And uh, Dr. Yasser Mohammed. I hope you enjoyed as much as we did uh, the presentation. And uh, it's not definitely the last one. It was the first from the series. So more and better, hopefully, yet to come. Uh, I wish you a very pleasant rest of the day. Uh, stay tuned because the video will be accessible through the CSIM and CIC websites.
yeah. and you will receive a follow-up uh, email um, uh, that will basically take your feedback and uh, take the needs for the future workshops. Dr. Nikbet, if I may, yes. before we of leave, course. Doctor, I could see Dr. Uh, Yasser Mohammed is still there. If he wanted to say something or maybe to share his experience with us on that. Sure. Well, I, I did not want to say anything. I, uh, I really appreciate uh, uh, the contribution of everyone in here. Uh, thank you all for coming and thank you for uh, everyone who participated to make this happen. Uh, we look forward to uh, uh, more collaboration and more useful workshop uh, for, for everyone here. Uh, thank you a lot, uh, very much. Thank you. Thanks to you and uh, enjoy the rest of the day. Bye-bye.